Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Cohen. And I'm Louise Palanker. Our mantra here at Media Path is too much content, too little time. We try to forage through all of your entertainment choices and pick out some highlights in order to streamline your life. The highlight of our show is special guests. And this time we have, for my money, one of the greatest comic impressionists working, Jim Meskimen, a talented and entertaining person, an actor who comes from television royalty, and we'll surprise you with that later, and we'll save that for a proper introduction. But first, Wheezy, what do you have for us this week? So, uh, Fritz, this week, you know, you and I both have Buffalo roots and much love for that city. This weekend, Buffalo suffered an atrocity inspired by the hate poisoning which would indoctrinate a lost teenager to believe that assassinating innocent shoppers will save the white race. The kid traveled for four hours to reach Buffalo. Rural racists don't even know enough people of color to hate them. They hate themselves and shoot at others. This is not a new story. Throughout the ages, folks have been indoctrinated to blame their pain on those who are different. Crimes against humanity taint and shape our shared histories. Holocausts, ethnic cleansings, mass murders have never will never correct. They will only corrode. Hate can never cure hate. Only love will do that. Our job as humans is to rise above hate. And one way we do that is by sharing stories. One such effort is the latest from PBS Masterpiece, and it's called Ridley Road. It's London in the summer of 1962, not even 20 years after the horrors of the Holocaust, and London is popping with new music, hip fashions, and a hot, happening hedonistic spirit. But it's baffling that one generation after defeating the Nazis and rising from the rubble, London is seething with anti-Semitic violence incited by homegrown neo-Nazis. Ridley Road is a four-episode drama based on Joe Bloom's acclaimed novel and inspired by true events. Agnes O'Casey plays Vivian Epstein, a young Jewish hairdresser whose passion for her mysterious boyfriend evolves into an urgency to join him in his efforts to infiltrate Britain's terrifyingly militant neo-Nazi hierarchy. Tom Vary plays Vivian's true love, Jack, and Rory Kinnear is Colin Jordan, the real-life leader of Britain's post-war Nazi movement. What can each one of us do when hate spills into violence? We can vote and campaign for candidates who insist on better mental health and gun safety policies, and we can tell the stories of good people pushing back, reclaiming their rights, and loving one another. Ridley Road is on PBS. How many episodes have they aired of that so far? I, I haven't found that, but I'm going to look for it because we can go to Amazon Prime and get the past broadcasts of PBS, right? Yes, absolutely. You can find all of it. And this is just ex- extraordinary, exceptional television. So well done and absolutely so so uh, pertinent. I'll, I'll tell you uh, uh, the whole heart-wrenching aspect of the Buffalo coverage, mm-hmm. and that is the diversity, not in race, but in background of the people killed. And these were lovely church going uh people making a difference in buffalo it really was so sad to hear the biographical information about all these people that have been broadcast on cnn and msnbc it's just awful and i i don't want to get into a big political diatribe here i am a person who believes the second amendment is the rope we need to hang ourselves something has to be changed it's an antiquated pre-1800 rule made by men with single-shot muskets that makes absolutely no sense at all. I think we should just go throughout the country door by door and saying, please give me your assault rifle and I will issue you your musket. That seems like a fair exchange if you want to be constitutional about it. But, you know, Buffalo is a very red-lined city. And by that, I mean they built um, expressways that surround the, the black neighborhood. And so... Those people, not only did they have express rays coming coming right through like their main drags, cutting off their ability to have a thriving infrastructure, but now they're trapped there in ways that are dangerous to them, including the, the high concentration of people of color if you're interested in perpetrating a hate crime. so it, it just, There was a movie made in Buffalo called Red Line, and it was about, it was a, it was a fictional 
a story created on the exact circumstance you're talking about, which is black people being rejected subliminally for loans to buy houses, which is the way they control the ethnic makeup of neighborhoods there. And it was really interesting. It would probably would be really valuable to see that movie now. I don't know who made it. It was a it was a low budget production, but I remember going to a screening at yeah. Shea's Buffalo Theater to see that thing. And uh it would make sense to see it now. Yeah, I would like to learn more about that. So, mm-hmm. so what have you brought to us? All right. Well, I, I am a huge fan of music documentaries. Even if I'm not a huge fan of the person in the documentary, I like the process. It's fascinating to me. However, I am a huge fan of Cheryl Crow. Cheryl dropped on Showtime last week, and it's really worth your time. It looks at her rise from a backup singer to a full-on global concert headliner. It shows her humanity that allows her to turn the darknesses of her life into rich rock and roll. There is only a short list of women who have reached the pinnacle of rock and roll stardom. I think a comparable person would be Linda Ronstadt, maybe not quite on that level, but uh, women who uh, had that sort of cachet around the world. The story goes into her romance with Lance Armstrong during all the revelations about his career. It goes into her very public battle with breast cancer. There's great commentary by one of her closest friends, Laura Dern, along with Keith, uh, Keith Richards, Joe Walsh, Emmylou Harris, and Brandy Carlisle. I've seen Cheryl in concert twice. Once she opened for James Taylor, and the other time she opened for the Eagles during their Hell Freezes Over tour at the Rose Bowl. And it occurred to me at the Rose Bowl, just like the Eagles are the quintessential California music sound, Cheryl Crow's music fits right in there from Every day is a winding road to first cut is the deepest if it makes you happy. And one of the great Southern California sing loud while driving songs, All I Want to Do. Cheryl is at the Hollywood Bowl with Keb Moe on Wednesday, August 3rd. I have not been compensated for this plug. (laughs) That is awesome. And I remember when our friend uh, Steve mentioned this because he had gone to Austin, uh, South by Southwest, and uh, he had seen the Cheryl. Uh, great show. Yeah. So that's a great pick. My next pick is especially relevant uh, based on today's guest because our own Jim Meskimen plays Florida Senator and Nixon supporting Senate Watergate Committee member Ed Gurney. What? In, yes, in Gaslit. So Gaslit is a mini series on stars, that's stars with a Z, based on the first season of the podcast Slow Burn. It breaks down fascinating and little known Watergate details, such as the story of Martha Mitchell. Do not become distracted by the Gaslit casting, which features Julia Roberts as Martha Mitchell and Sean Penn as John Mitchell. If you are not as equally obsessed with Watergate lore as am I, you'll watch the whole thing, call me up and say, it was good, but I never saw Sean Penn. You did. He played Attorney General slash Nixon campaign chair slash felon John Mitchell, and he's in there somewhere underneath all of that fantastic makeup. Gaslit assumes you already know your Watergate basics, and it gets right into the peculiar personalities who populate the scandal. It turns out Nixon's inner circles were teeming with comically inept and corrupt morons and maniacs such as Howard Hunt, James McCord, and G. Gordon Liddy. Of course, it's funny when it's history, but I think we know that the energy currently fueling Republican politics is more toxic by multitudes. It's like the horror movie where the monster spawn regenerates with increasingly toxic virulence. Martha Mitchell was the attorney general's wife, nicknamed the Mouth of the South. She was a blunt and colorful figure who appeared on talk shows spilling delicious dish about her political society associates. Naturally, when Watergate exploded, her husband needed to keep her silent, which he did by putting her under abusive house arrest, to which she responded by going full whistleblower. But was Martha too wacky to be believed? That's how the right chose to spin it as Martha pulled the pin on a grenade that brought down her personal life and a presidency. It's so good and important. Power attracts maniacs. We need to be careful. You can watch Gaslit featuring Jim Meskimen on Stars. Well, I am obsessed with Watergate because it was like the pivotal political drama of my life. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I was like a flag-waving, conservative-loving history buff. And then I came home from school every day and watched Watergate. When Nixon resigned, my parents, who you know are dyed-in-the-wool Republicans, when Nixon resigned, my mother said, I will never read another newspaper 
in my life, and wow. she never did. Now, she watched Fox News a hell of a lot, but didn't read any more newspapers after that. It was an interesting So did time. she feel, did she blame the newspapers for bringing down Nixon? Yeah, she blamed the media. She thought that the whole thing was a conspiracy. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, it's the same thing you have today where there's no sense to be taught to people who refuse to have it. Well, but I, I'm telling you that my reaction to Watergate was going, oh, wow, politicians can be bad guys. Like, that, I, it just opened my eyes, whereas your mom was like, I'm not going to look anymore. I worked at an all-night uh, shift at a radio station from midnight to six and then i would get off and i would go to the men's clothing store where i used to work at about eight in the morning and wait for the tailor to open up and then i would go sit in the back of the men's clothing store and watch the watergate hearings until i couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and then i would go home and sleep it was it it was it consumed my life at the time i just couldn't believe it It, yeah for me it was just really important for us to learn like with this medium of television for us to be educated as to what could go wrong if we're attempting to keep this republic that benjamin franklin handed to us so imagine if we were going through all the trumpification of the world today having not had the watergate experience and knowing that politics can be dark but we can recover from it emotionally Mm -hmm. if we didn't know that we'd be even more scared now than we are you are right that's it that is a very good point Let's introduce our guest. Okay, our guest is Jim Meskimen. He is a wonderful actor, comedian, and impressionist who's best known for his voiceover work in video games. He appeared, as uh, Weezy said, in Ghastly, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, American Auto, Bad Detective. His YouTube videos are wonderful. And we have to mention, he is the son of one of our favorite people, Marion Ross, Mrs. C from Happy Days. Jim, welcome. We're so happy to have a chance to talk to you. Hey, thank you. It's so nice to have that nice thing in common that we both love my mom. Oh, uh, there we go. She, she's astonishing. I bet you have that in common with many folks who I ask do. you. I, I share her with many people. And and there must have been a lot of people that have said to you, like, gee, I wish Marion Ross was my mom. And are you silently thinking, no, you don't. Or no, actually, no, actually, what people say is you, your mom raised me. Aww. So they, they feel like she was their mom. And 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 Marion Cunningham was definitely as much their mom as mine, because my mom, Marion Ross, was very different from Marion Cunningham. Uh, we Marian had Henry, this wonderful Henry Winkler was our guest last week and said that she was one of the most mentoring and iconic figures in his career and his life in general he worships they have a beautiful her. relationship they've had a really wonderful friendship all these years and it's, uh, it's I, I just cool. want to say one thing about you know being a stand-up and i i always look for the humor and everything what i love about your performances is the jokes you do in addition to the impressions they could actually the material could stand alone even without the impressions it's smart and funny you have brilliant lines that put the character into context. The greatest example I heard in watching all your YouTube videos is Kevin Spacey, where you're trying to teach people how to do a Kevin Spacey impersonation. And you say, let the bottom part of your face relax and then suck the sympathy out of your soul. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yes, that was that was long before his debacle and his... his uh his topple from fame no but as an actor and the character we knew him as it was just a great description of yeah his. thank you well i appreciate it yeah it's uh, sorry schadenfreude there for uh for old uh kevin but uh who, who my wife and, and i grew up with kevin spacey not far away she did plays with him and i i saw him in plays in high school so oh. i've known him a, a good long time and uh, one of the last one of the last films he ever made, which will probably never be finished, was about Gore Vidal, a movie oh. called Gore. And I played Johnny Carson. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, but as I say, it'll never see the light of day. But um, anyway, but, uh, on to brighter topics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess that's one of the casualties of finding out the truth about someone is sometimes it can destroy not just their career, but peripherally whoever was working with them. Yeah, it, could, it can take out three or four minutes of your comedy routine, right? Like that. Boom. Wow. So what when you're kind of like capturing a voice, like mm-hmm. is there is there a secret to it or is it just a talent that you've had since you were a little kid and then you then trying to explain to us how you do it when it just comes naturally to you? Well, a certain degree of it does come naturally because I've always been interested in it and partly was growing up with Marion. Marion, my mom, was uh, uh, just a wonderful mom and she would call my attention to people's accents and the way that people behaved and and we sort of played with copying people just for our own amusement, which is how most impressionists do it. They do it because it's fun and funny, not because they think they're going to make a fortune at it, you know, when they're kids. And uh, I never really had a, a goal to be 
Rich Little, although I really love Rich Little and, and was so impressed as we all were with his capacious talents, but I just, I just enjoyed playing around. And um, uh, so there's no secret other than, you know, it's kind of like music. You, you listen and you develop your ear and you, if you're, I imagine if you've ever played a musical instrument, sometimes you have to work at these chord changes and, and it takes some practice. And the people that aren't that interested and that dedicated never really get the hang of it. So but you're supposed to change like, chords? You're supposed to change chords? Because that's an important <laughs> Optimally. Note. Every yeah, now okay. and then you should change a chord. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know but, a lot but about you, song. That's right? a great point. But you do change chords. And one of the things that makes you different and interesting is Rich Little would do an impression of, say, Jack Nicholson. And that would be good and it would laugh and you'd have a one-line joke in there. But you do a thing where your impression morphs over time. So you'll do a, a young Jack Nicholson evolving into an old Jack Nicholson. Why don't right, you give us right. a little taste of that, if you don't mind? Well, yeah, so young Jack Nicholson, when we first meet him, is, uh, you know, he's got a young physicality. So he's uh, a little more taut, a little more bright, a little more snappy. And then we meet him later on. He gets a little more established. He's got a couple <laughs> Oscars under his belt. That can't be comfortable. <laughs> now, when you see Jack, if, you, if you're lucky enough to see Jack, he's, uh, well, he's more of a senior statesman. <laughs> Out, you know. That's kind of like Martin Short doing the various notes of Jerry Lewis, you know, eating yeah, a lozenge yeah. or being. Like... <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, these great personalities that we see and these great artists that we revere, they don't just stay the same. Right. Uh, mm. They not only get older, but they change their character. They change like we all do, you know, we, we don't notice that we change too, but um, with celebrities, you can, you can easily see it's documented on YouTube and other things that you can see how a young, you, these days I love, cause I study YouTube all the time to learn characters and to study voices. And you can watch a famous person who's 80 now, and you can see them when they're 19 or 20 being mm -hmm. interviewed and all these different states in their career. And I mean, we've never really had that before where right. you can, get a really c contain a person's whole existence as an artist and and watch it and learn from it it's extraordinary right the the availability of this content that enriches and informs us is is changing the way our brains are wired i think do you notice that wow. with your kids that grew up kind of native to having this accessible to them that they're learning exponentially more quickly than we did when we had to go to the library and order a book and wait a month for it to arrive uh, I suppose so. My daughter's in her 30s now, so I, <laughs> well, not the best person to ask about that. <laughs> you, you do another thing, which is, again, m makes you separate and above other impressionists, in my opinion. And that is you, you have a great skill for pointing out the similarities in various people's voices. You do... I, I hope you'll do this for me right now, just for my own personal aggrandizement. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones, Dr. Uh -huh. Phil, and Al Gore. Oh, okay. So, well, uh, see, now Al Gore and Tom Tommy Lee Jones were roommates in college. Did you know that? At Harvard. I did know At that. Harvard, yeah. So you can imagine, you know, uh, uh, Al Gore being perturbed by Tommy Lee Jones. And <laughs> say, listen, Tommy, I have to talk to you because you have been leaving. Uh, you you're not wearing your shoes. You come in, you're tracking all kinds of mud in your bare feet. You're leaving a carbon footprint. <laughs> That's very amusing. But uh, if you expect I'm going to change my habits just because you're irritated, you're wrong. <laughs> and then Dr. Phil could come in and he's got a similar voice, maybe a little deeper, but and with a totally different emphasis. And he uses his shoulders a lot more when he talks. <laughs> say, Guys, let's just take your separate corners. <laughs> That's I hope wonderful. that's a old routine. I don't remember. All no, the it's okay. It's wonderful. Like that. It's but on that YouTube we, too. So do you kind of like categorize your impressions around like people who you, you notice they sound similar before you start trying to do them or you notice they start to sound familiar as you, tr as you hear your voice doing their voice? Yeah. I mean, it's all fair, right? It's an art form. So for me, I, I go with my affinity for the character very much. You know, I, I'm, 
interested in people that I'm attracted to. Like, you know, we all love Robin Williams and I developed a Robin Williams impression quite early on. <laughs> and he's got this marvelous kind of, you know, rapidity with which he expresses his ideas so he can get in and out. It's sort of like a smash and grab burglar. <laughs> <laughs> but also is, is capable of great tenderness and great sincerity. And, uh, when he slows down, it's, I think, in some ways even more moving. But do you notice so, that, you awesome. know, I know you've, you've noticed this because you're filming yourself, putting yourself on YouTube, but like your face takes on their mannerisms, like your face takes on their emotions. Like you, yeah. you're really becoming all, this. Thank you. It's all a piece, you know, I, I, that's what acting is. Acting is taking on the viewpoint of another character. And uh, I, I, it's very hard to do. Uh, characters without becoming them fully like if i just try to do the voice uh, it's uh, i don't know it's harder to reach if you just kind of sort of become like patrick stewart sort of instantly become that person <laughs> and uh, it changes everything the way that you move your hands and your eyebrows of course and um i, I wouldn't know how to isolate the physicality from the <laughs> audibility if you will wow that's really really cool well you know uh Kevin Pollack, who, who's a friend who yeah. I did stand up with, I know Kevin. Yeah, is is known for a couple of his killer top drawer impressions, like Christopher Walken and William Shatner. Yeah. yeah. But what I love about yours is talk about Christopher Walken and talk about the quality of his voice. You have a great line about that, but I want to hear you say it. Well, I hope I remember the line that you're thinking <laughs> of. I'll do it for you. Because the, here's here's your observation about how Christopher Walken uses his voice. Where he ends up at the end of a sentence, he sounds like he's shooing away pigeons. <laughs> it's just great. I don't I don't remember saying that. That's, that's a really nice line. I'm gonna, hold on, I'm going to write that down. Put it back in your act. <laughs> it was on that's YouTube. A good one. It's a, it's a yeah, wonderful I mean, one. I think the thing about Christopher Walken and Kevin Pollack does a fantastic. Christopher Walken is that he's unpredictable and we've all kind of gotten used to the kind of unpredictability that you expect from a Walken performance. Now, <laughs> recently I saw him on a talk show and I felt like, I felt like, you know, he's obviously been exposed to a lot of people doing his voice and is aware that we're all out here <laughs> trying to do it, you know, and, and loving it. And I felt like he was trying, I felt like he was holding himself back. Like he was actually trying not to sound like Christopher Walken, <laughs> which must be very tough if you're Christopher Walken. <laughs> I really did notice that. I thought, you know, he's holding back. Yeah. He's trying not to be peculiar. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder if. But I sure respect him as an actor. He's just always delicious. You know? I mean, I guess if a lot of people are doing impressions of you, it's hard to not get self-conscious about how you sound. What's that like? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I'm I, I'm a perpetrator, but, you know, what I can't imagine what it's like to be, uh, you, I mean, you'd have to embrace it. You'd have to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger and say, of course, everyone, who, why wouldn't they imitate me? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm fantastic. Uh, as the governor of California, I, you know, I'm wonderful. So you just have to make your peace with it, I guess, and, and, and know that it's, it is an expression of respect and admiration. How many presidents can you do? Oh, a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. I, all the way Millard back to... Millard Fillmore. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Millard Fillmore. Yeah, my Millard Fillmore is really pretty good. Pretty good. I think I'm probably the world's best. Uh, I had to do, I've had to do them various times for, for film assignments and television things. And uh, I did... Uh, Harry Truman, nobody really remembers what Harry Truman sounded like, but uh, I did Harry Truman for George Clooney in his movie Monuments Men, where he had to have a conversation with Harry Truman, and he had an actor that looked like Harry Truman. And Harry Truman is actually quite a bit like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> and that's, my, that's my, really my day job. I do Colonel Sanders for the radio and TV commercials, oh my. Uh, which is a great, uh, great honor and a pleasure to do Harlan Sanders. I always love doing that. That's pretty good. Uh, that's been that's a real awesome. pleasure to do. Yeah. Uh, he's sort he's sort of presidential in a lot of ways, you know, with that little string yeah, string is. tie. Yeah. You, you you said or it was in some of your bio stuff that you, like the dominant uh block of your career is uh doing voiceovers for games and stuff. Is that true? Uh I wouldn't say dominant, but I I, I do a fair amount of games. Uh I, I I mostly I've done commercials and uh, uh and you know, there's this whole niche of, of dialogue replacement for films and, and trailers. Mm -hmm. 
And I've done a ton of those. And most voice actors I know, my, my fellow impressionists, that's a big part of their business because, uh, you know, a, an actor like, like Colin Firth, for example, uh, Colin Firth <laughs> in 1917, a very fine film that he, they used his voiceover quite a lot in the promotion and the marketing of the film. And, um, but they wanted to change the dialogue quite a lot from the movie to make it shorter to fit into the, the trailer and make mm-hmm. it more punchy, I suppose. And um, so they would hire people like me to uh, create that voice and, and to record that way. And there's a lot of that that goes on in, in trailers. You know, you'll hear like there'll be a scene where Robert De Niro says, I don't think it's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, his original line in the movie might have been, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think this is going to work out for two reasons. One, <laughs> you know, and it's long and they want to just kind of squish it. I think they're just intimidated. They don't want to call Robert. They don't want to call him in. That's they don't want to call him. Well, the, he's one of your big three, Pacino, Walken, and De Niro, right? The big three, yeah. yeah. The, the, the New York three. And uh, Al Pacino. Al. <laughs> Al is fantastic. He is a force of nature. <laughs> And walking, of course, is who he is, you know, basically a dancer who dances with his voice. <laughs> but Robert De Niro is, is different. You know, his mouth is upside down. <laughs> so, is... It's tough. It's tough. Now, when you uh-huh. when you play George Washington crossing the Delaware, your mother said that she is the mother of the father of our country very proudly. But how <laughs> do you right. how do you kind of nail George Washington? Like, how do you get down oh, his essence? Well, that's that's fun because then we're creating. We're not copying anything. So, mm-hmm. in, you know, we've all been exposed to imagery of George Washington, of which there are like, what, five paintings? I mean, it's not a lot. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, of, of contemporary to his life. So so we have to use our imagination 100 uh, percent. We learned with Daniel Day-Lewis that Lincoln had a rather high voice because of descriptions and the research they did. Mm-hmm. Washington, I don't know. I never read anything to describe what his voice was like, mm-hmm. except they you know, they obviously we revere him a lot as a leader. So when I created my Washington, it was sort of a little bit campy and over the top. Like <laughs> I'm George Washington and we're crossing the Delaware Expressway. Move, man, move. <laughs> <laughs> the Delaware Expressway, and, that's and, right. You know, it's a, it, it, nobody knows. So, you know, the advertising people wisely chose me. So I'm Of course. I often wonder if those guys maybe had a, a British lilt to their accent mm. because we have well, he that, would have. He, that he was in the British army. So he yeah, could. like we have that Atlantic accent that lingers through Catherine Hepburn and and then sort of fades. But those people sounded kind of those fancy East Coast people sounded kind of British. That's right. Those they, uh, they had that mid-Atlantic accent. There which you sound Just a slight bit British, but uh, is quite American, too, as that sort of 1940s sound. That sort of wonderful, and classy. Where is my Connecticut martini? Anyway? Yeah. Where is my martini? Yeah, yeah, clenched. Yeah, that's right. And FDR had that accent, but he FDR, was FDR exactly. He had a, a sort of a strange hybrid East Coast accent, and of course, when we hear FDR, he's always speaking loudly like this <laughs> because of the uh, recording equipment of the time, the radio, etc. But if you heard a human being speak like this in real life, you'd think it was a cartoon character. <laughs> That's awesome. You talked about Rich Little. Who were some of your other influences when you were in your nascent period? Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. Frank when Rich Gorsham, Little was on. Sorry? John Biner. Uh, to some degree. Biner was really weird, though, huh? Uh, funny, but really out there. Uh, Rich Little, I appreciated his technique uh, so much. Now, as a kid, it was just magical. And I, I've, I've noticed that, you know, when you search through uh, YouTube for Rich Little stuff, he has these wonderful things. Uh, clips where he is in the presence of the person he's imitating, like like Jimmy Stewart. He's, he's right there with Jimmy Stewart on the on the dais at the some kind of big uh, George Slatter celebrity roast. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, that's got to be an advantage, I think. You know. Well, did that has that ever happened to you, where you've encountered that? You know, just someone says, "I hear you do me," and then you're put on the spot. Well, you know, not in that quite in that way, but I have. Uh, I, I've sort of established policy not to do that uh, because I'll, unless I guess if it was for a goof or a show or for an mm-hmm. audience, but in real life, I think it takes a toll and has a negative effect on the person you're imitating. And no matter how good you are, because anytime anybody says, oh, hey, I'll, I'm going to do your voice now. 
like like Fritz, I'm going to do your voice now. There is a feeling of evaluation that comes along with it. That's not oh, so that's nice. very it's not interesting. So pleasant. Yeah. It's not the effect I really want to create. Uh, however, I do uh, Ron Howard's voice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, I've met Ron, of course. I work for him. On, he's cast me in five films, and uh, I, I have tremendous respect for Ron. And uh, one time, I got hired to do a, a voiceover for uh, an event that was honoring Imagine Entertainment. And it was Ron Howard's monologue saying, we started to imagine Brian and I, blah, 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 in such and such a year. And we did these films and blah. And I turned to the guys I was working for and I said, now, is this event, is Ron going to be at this event? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, he's, he and Brian are being honored. I was like, well, is it kind of weird that I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this voice? Can't you get Ron Howard to do this voice? <laughs> and uh, I forget what their answer was, but uh Quite a bit later, I asked, I ran into Ron and I asked him, hey, not for nothing, but uh, were you at an event and uh, they were honoring you and you heard this voice and he went, oh, yeah, 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 I wondered about that. <laughs> I thought, I thought maybe I had a cold. Or something. So, so he didn't know it was you? No. Oh, my didn't. gosh. So I think have, a red flag went up. Otherwise, I don't think he would have remembered it. Have but. you done more Ron Howard movies than Clint Howard? Oh, no, no, no. He still that, has believe, the lead there. I believe he holds the record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so. Hey, I don't know if you've read, and this is, you know, I, I should be plugging myself, I suppose, but this book, uh, The Boys yeah. by Ron and Clint Howard, their wonderful autobiography is sensational. Yeah, I've read that. I just loved it. I thought it was just, you know, I thought I knew what the book was going to be about because I know both those guys and I know about their history, but man, it's so much greater. A story I used to than see their dad, Rance Howard, at Rance. Patty's restaurant sitting right at the corner. Yeah. And he was very patient with the general public would want to come up and talk to him. I never did. Right, but he'd just right, sit there right. and he'd bend over. You know, and well, they grew up like a couple blocks from there, as you'll read in the book. And I love reading books that overlap one another in terms of uh, the storytelling. So uh -huh. if you, re you read your mom's book, this is right. my recommendation, dear, dear listener. <laughs> read read Marion Ross's book and then read uh, Ron, How Ron and Clint Howard's book and then read – the book I'm reading now by Karen Knotts, who's the daughter of oh, yeah. uh, Don yeah, Knotts. Tied up in so, knots. Yeah, and uh, it's just fun to see all the different perspectives of the same angle, which is like, you know, for me, a kid growing up in suburban Buffalo, it was like, what would it be like to be a kid growing up in Los Angeles? And And you were right in the middle of it. And how did that feel for you, knowing that your mom went and did this cool thing? Did that have a huge influence on, on your career choice? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was a, a cartoonist, illustrator, painter. I was on that track. And that's what was my first career. I worked for Hanna-Barbera and then I worked for Rankin Bass in New York. And I, I did a lot of freelance work and I studied art in Spain and, and really was going down that path. But I, I, I did sort of get a taste of what it was like uh, from watching and observing my mom's career. And I felt like, of course, attracted to the attention and you know, the kind of exciting newness of it and the surprise of it all. And, and, uh, and, and it did change our, you know, our, our lifestyle uh, a lot because you know, to go from a single mom who was a struggling actress to being a woman on a, a hit TV show changes everything. And that happened uh, right but, in the middle of your childhood, correct? Because your mom. Well, it's really at the end. I mean, I was oh. a, a young teen when it started. And then uh, by the time it was over, I guess I was about 20 or 21. So, yeah, but I, I, I was, you know, it took me a while to get kind of uh, make peace with the fact that I, I wanted to be an actor and I had to kind of figure it out, you know, because uh, I did put a lot, invest a lot of time in being a, an artist. And I still like to create art, but I like the social aspect much more of being a performer. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like in reading your mom's book that she was just heroically able to give you guys a real childhood, even in the face of what you you didn't need to understand as a child what was going on in her in her relationship with with your dad, correct? Yeah, she you know she's a Midwest girl uh, from Minnesota, Albert Lee, Minnesota, and uh, you know she did a really great job. I you know as a as now a married uh, father of one child, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and we worked our tails off, and my wife we and I we would just be knackered at the end of the day with one kid. Uh, I couldn't imagine really what she had to go through with me and Ellen, my sister. So uh, I, my my hats off to her. I treasure her so much. Well, I'm I'm curious about your transition between careers. How old were you when you went from the art world to the performance world, and and when when did you realize that your passion for the performance overcame the passion for the art? 
Well, it's interesting because it really was a problem for me. I was I'd invested so much time and and so much of my life and my interest uh, in in drawing. You know, I, I read Mad Magazine and I learned a kind of cartoon from that. And I was the school cartoonist and I did the political cartoons for the the, the high school paper and 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 I really thought I was going down that path. And I worked for Hanna Barbera one summer doing you know storyboards and. And then, but inside of me was this interest in voices and characters and acting out. And many artists have that. I know many uh, visual artists, cartoonists that are also good at voices and stuff like that. But, but I felt like I really needed to kind of choose one, you know, it was a bit of a Sophie's choice. And I was um, walking down the street in Madrid, Spain, where I was studying, I'd been studying art and I was kind of at this weird crossroads and I was about 22 and I ran into the actor Harvey Keitel mm-hmm. on the streets of Madrid as I'm having this, you know, kind of crisis. And, you know, Harvey Keitel is a terrific actor. He's, uh, <laughs> he could be one of the big three in New York. He's so great. And uh, I stopped him and talked to him on the street a little while. And he's, uh, he was very generous with his time. He told me what he was doing, shooting a movie here in Madrid, blah, blah, blah. And after he left, my heart was just Aww. going crazy, you know. Yeah. And I, I had the presence of mind to kind of, observe that and and note that and i and i had this epiphany i realized oh my god you know i've met the greatest painters in spain i've met some amazing artists i my heart didn't go nuts like that Uh, so i immediately made plans to move to new york and that's where i started my career and where did you get to practice your impressionistic chops at first did you do comedy clubs in new york or no, I, I'm not a stand-up, and I didn't do comedy clubs, although that was the beginning of so much uh, great comedy in New York in the 80s, early 80s. But I was in the improv world, mm-hmm. so I did improv theater for 10 or more years, uh, and and that really was where I drilled, drilled, drilled the quick changes. And uh, we did this uh, – I was in a group called Interplay, and we did a bit where uh, we'd get a, a name of a famous famous man in history – and then I would do a, we would do like a scene with another person with a, a biopic of that person's life. And then we would change the leading man of that biopic. So it would be, you know, John Wayne as Stalin or whatever, you know, whoever the, the figure was. <laughs> okay. And Which I, not you know, stretch. the audience would call it out and I would <laughs> change on a dime. And the fun got to be, how quickly can I change viewpoint? Oh. And I found that you can change viewpoint very quickly, uh, less than a second. And, uh, and audiences love that. They love to see a guy change into Sir Ian McKellen, for example. I mean, as long as we're here, why don't we <laughs> demonstrate what I'm talking about, you see? Or Sam Elliott. It doesn't take long. All you got to do is make a decision. <laughs> and that's all. A fait wow. accompli, as they say. Oh. How often do you get to take out your act, for lack of a better term, and do one person shows or one person presentations, because I know you're an actor primarily and do all these other yeah. things, but do you get to take your show out and do it on large stages around? I have in the past and I, I intend to in the future. Right now it's been a little while and uh, it hasn't quite opened up to that degree for me where I'm, I'm getting booked a lot of places. Uh, and, and that's fine because I, as you said, I've been doing a lot of television and uh, also, I need to re- rewrite everything. You know, we talked about Kevin Spacey. Mm-hmm. You know, these they're celebrities that mm-hmm. come and go. They mm-hmm. suddenly mean something different. Like even Robin Williams, you know, right after he passed, it was like, I'm going to retire this for now because mm-hmm. it doesn't mean what it used to mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, now it means something tragic. With a little bit of passage of time, now it's, more, it's a little more interesting to bring Robin back. We still remember him as a person who thought outside the box and had big ideas and was creative. And we don't immediately uh, recall the tragedy of it. So, so I got to rewrite the show and then get it on its feet. Well, and, I want to uh, talk I'm, to you. I'm working on it. I want to talk to you a little bit uh, before Kathy Ladman joins us. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Gaslit because I am obsessed with it. So you play Nixon supporting Senate Watergate committee member, Senator Ed Gurney of Florida, who not long after Watergate stepped down from office following his own indictment on influence peddling. You don't want to get caught influence peddling. Uh, when when you're playing a real life Wikipedia entry, how much of what you can learn about him enters your performance? <laughs> That's such a great insult. You Wikipedia entry. <laughs> uh, well, I did my research on 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 Mr. Gurney. Mostly, I was looking for uh, physicality and and vocally mm-hmm. uh, to see what kind of. Again, you mentioned he's from Florida, but he originally was from. New York. So he had this kind of interesting hybrid 
uh, accent that was not completely Southern, but also had hints of, of the East Coast in it as well. So very interesting uh, thing to try to duplicate. Uh, but I, I like to do uh, people that are documented and his, historical. It's, it's fun for me. And uh, this project was, was delightful. It was directed by a guy named Matt Ross, who is an actor himself and has starred in films. Mm-hmm. Also a terrific director. And um, I really like working with him. And, and the first day, you talk about uh, not recognizing Sean Penn. I, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of Oscar winners, actually. I've worked for probably about 12 of them. And uh, there's, you know, depending on who they are, you get, you get a little nervy. You know, I talked about my heart pounding with Harvey Keitel. I, I was like, God, I don't, I hope I can be cool around Sean Penn. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, he and I had a scene together. It was a wonderful scene on a, you'll see it in a week or two on a golf course. And uh, I walked into the holding area in this country club where we were waiting and and there was nobody in there except for this fat, bald guy (laughs) who came up to me and said, hi, I'm Sean. I said, (laughs) if you say so. (laughs) Uh, the makeup is so well, you've seen it. I mean, it's really astonishing. By the way, I know the guy that designed it and I met him on the Grinch when he was a young oh. makeup artist. His name is Kazuhiro. And he designed uh, Gary Oldman's makeup for uh, Darkest Hour and won an Oscar. Holy for it. Oh, cow, that's wow. Right. It's so good. It's so good. And, and, and I watched it. You know, I was with Sean Penn in inside, outside for hours and hours and talking with him and sitting next to him and being real close. And Man, you can't see a seam. It's just completely no convincing. glue oozing in the heat of the lights. Nothing. That's no, brilliant. he really he he's able to embody John Mitchell, who's a very familiar figure from my childhood. You know, watching Watergate play out. And if someone said to me, "Hey, you know, how about Sean Penn for John Mitchell?" You know, I would have. <laughs> You know, continued laughing for a few days, yeah. and then I yeah. would have said, "Okay, well, how about you know who you know? Let's all right, let's actually have this conversation." So how how does that come to be? Where Sean Penn says, or someone says, like, because it can't be like originally the filmmaker's idea. It had to have been Sean Penn's idea, right? Because no one else would have suggested it, right? Box That's office appeal good. too. No, very but it's question. like so crazy. Like, is there any other casting you can think of that's so not? so off point where well remember he played harvey milk and and, and on paper that probably seemed weird too he was wonderful as harvey milk yeah but this is like sean penn is like a nice looking youngish looking guy and john mitchell is a old fat bald guy like that's that's all i can say other than the acting when he is in his makeup he does become john mitchell and there is an endearing quality to him that Sean brings to him. He really yeah. does love his wife and yeah. he really is a person. He just got all caught up in this whole it Nixon or nothing kind of. Yeah. You'll see it more as, the, as in the, in the episodes that are going to come, you'll see that tenderness and where their relationship began and everything. It's, it's, it's a great job. I mean, Julia was fantastic and, and Sean was fantastic and it's a very, uh, very unusual project but i got to give a lot of credit to matt ross who, who directed all the episodes in this limited series series he's uh, very very talented we're gonna see big things from him tell us about your youtube channel and where we can see your stuff and we are dying for a celebrity fortune cookie opening oh well there's some yes. there's a thing called youtube yeah uh, <laughs> if you type in my name or jim pressions is my handle that i go on with most social Ooh, media instagram tiktok jim pressions yeah it's uh-huh. also the name of my one-man show when i when i have it up and running yeah and every day uh, if you subscribe, or even if you don't, I do a celebrity fortune cookie. I have a wheel of impressions. I spin the wheel. What have I got here? Marlon Brando. Okay, Marlon Brando. And then I took a celebrity. I took a cookie. And uh, pardon me, because I'm going to have to put on my spectacles. The writing, the typesetting is so blasted small. Laziness is nothing more than the habit of resting before you get tired. <laughs> I thought when I first looked at this, I thought it said laziness is nothing more than the habit of resting before you get fired. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Another, That's good too. Another mm. definition. Works either way. <laughs> let's do another one. Let's do that. Was not hilarious, but let's get another one. And we got. We got Steve Martin. Mm-hmm. Okay, Steve Martin. We'll Play. be happy to read this little snippet. Uh, patience is one of the hardest 
virtues to master. Patience is one of the hardest virtues to master. It's true. I wish you could have got that got that out in fewer words, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. And one I, I more it, here. Yeah. It's Those interesting that magic number. And we got uh, Slim Pickens. Okay. Oh, okay. Slim Pickens. I'm sure you remember the great cowboy actor, Slim Pickens. And let's see if I can make a head or tail of this one. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. You may diet. Isn't that charming? That, that's what passes for a one-liner in, in, uh, in Wuhan. Uh, do, your, do your fortunes have any lucky numbers on the back? Oh, yeah, they do. They all do. I never pay much lotto. attention to those. Maybe, yeah, a, yeah lucky number. You mm. get, uh, yeah, 55, 30, 41, 56, 10, 9. No! Oh! Oh. Drat. Well, you're an enormously talented person. I was really looking forward to talking to you, enjoying all your YouTubes. And you're you're, you're smart YouTubes. and funny. Thanks for watching my YouTubes. YouTubes and uh, get your YouTubes tied. And uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the thing about it is, impressions don't always have to be funny. I learned that from Jim Carrey, watching him at the Comedy Store, and he was like 16 when he came down from Canada. Wow. He does a show-stopping impression of Henry Fonda doing a scene from On Golden Pond. There are no jokes, and you can hear a pin drop in that room for five, mm. 10 minutes at a time. Mm. And then he does something with humor attached, and it makes the humor explode even more. So it doesn't have to be funny every minute. It still can be touching. And agree, agree. Yeah, it's really just a tool in any actor's tool belt. You know, Kenneth Branagh uses impressions all the time when he pay, portrays famous people, and it's not for comedy. It's for the illusion of putting that person there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fun so, talking to you, sir. Well, Continue success. I don't want to say goodbye until Kathy comes, but I because I want to ask you about the Big Door Prize. Thank you. The Big Door Prize is a show that I a series uh, that I am uh, working on, uh, and it is going to be coming out, I think, in October on Apple. It stars Chris O'Dowd, the wonderful Irish actor Chris O'Dowd. You might remember him from Bridesmaids. He's a very charming, wonderful, talented guy, <laughs> and uh, it was done by uh, produced by one of the creators of Schitt's Creek. Uh, it's going to be super fun and inventive and uh, and dry and and delightful. I think it's coming out in the fall. We just finished shooting it. Uh, the big door prize. No door prize in it. It's about a fortune telling machine that suddenly appears in a small town, very high tech and purports to tell everybody their destiny. Ooh. And everybody in the small town gets just their wits wrapped around this, and their panties in a bunch, all about <laughs> what their destinies should be. And uh, I think it's going to be a really charming and show. Who do you play? I'm not at limit. I'm not at liberty to say. I see. I see. Isn't that odd? But I'm not. But eventually, I will be. We'll come back. I'll tell you. All right. Or you can just watch the show. It'll be obvious. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Great to talk to you. Thank you so very much. Take so care, much Jim. For me. See you, Jim. I'll, my, I'll tell my mom hi for you. Oh, Please yes. do. P say hi from her. us. The biggest yeah. smile in show business, Mary. Oh, Ross. she's so cute. Kathy All Rodman. Right. Is Kathy here? Kathy. Hi. Hi. Hey. Folks, it's a double treat. One of the great stand-up comedians working along with being a writer and an actor. She's been on The Tonight Show, The Late Late Show. Curb Your Enthusiasm. She wrote on King of Queens. She won the American Comedy Award for Best Female Stand-Up in 1993. And... She has a wonderful new one-person show called Does This Show Make Me Look Fat? The title wins with me. The answer is it's no. It's June 3rd, 4th, and 5th at the Pico Playhouse at 10508 West Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles. If we have piqued your interest, you can get tickets at www.tickettailor.com or you can go to her website, kathyladman.com, for more information. So happy to see you. I'm excited for you. Great to see you. You know, I'm in the desert right now um, at my director's house. We're, we've been rehearsing since Saturday, and that's a portrait of her over there. So it looks, it's, it, so just so you know what you're going to be staring at. Well, I'm excited to tell people about this because you're a brilliant stand-up. You're a wonderful writer. I've always enjoyed your stuff so much, but this is not... This is about something, uh, something yes. that was a great deal of pain, but a great deal of growth in your life. Talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I became an anorexic um, at about age 18, 18 or 19, and have uh, really struggled with it in my, certainly through my 20s and into my 30s a bit. And then I found a way to deal with it. Um, most, I mean, through therapy, 
um, and medication. And, and also a, a big deal of it was through Overeaters Anonymous. And I cover all of this in the show. And while there's really no cure for this disease, there's a lot of hope. And that's something that I really want to um, impart through this show. Well, I think a lot of people will benefit from what you say in not just that challenge, but other challenges, the challenges of addiction of all kinds. But I think our first exposure to eating disorders was Karen Carpenter. When right. when they put a face to anorexia and what that right. ended as tragically. And, and so how do you modify your behavior trying to come out of that disorder? What do you do? How do you change? Well, your life? I mean, a lot of times I have to. Uh, what I've what I've really come to is a place of acceptance, and um, I may, I may not like. I, I you know I see through distorted eyes. Um, I may not like what I see, but I accept what I see. Uh, and while I oh no, my friend's dog is trying to get in here. Oh, no, Finn, you can't come in here. No, all right, hold on. We'll hold on. Don't worry about it. Okay. No problem. It's going to be, I'm sorry. No, we can get him. That's okay. I think uh, I think people yeah. are going to... Yeah. Get up on the bed. Get up on the bed. Good boy. Good, <laughs> Good boy. Man. Okay, sorry. Can, um, we can we see him? He's, he's big. He's like he's a big. Rottweiler okay. um, uh, lab mix, I think. Mm -hmm. So what I was saying was that um, it's about accepting yourself and it's about modifying... Like, Whereas I used to, I used to really starve myself in the depths of my disease. I starved myself. Um, I existed on so little food. And then I had to get into the habit of eating food because I had to mm -hmm. and not denying my hunger. I was so used to denying my hunger, wow. uh, depriving myself. So it falls under the category of OCD, correct? Um, I think so. Do you, have you looked this up, Louise? No, I just, I know I struggle with some OCD things where you're constantly trying to convince yourself that, that you can't control everything yes. and that, yes. so it's what I, so it, it, or just the repeated thought that you have to do a thing when you don't really have to do a thing, right? Or the repeated yeah, thought that I you mean, have to, it, you have to be hungry when you don't really have to be hungry. But I just wanted to run this by you because tell me if I'm if I'm if I'm close or if I'm just have lost the mark entirely. But okay. I give advice to kids and ha and have a column where I answer questions from teenagers and have an app where I answer questions for teenagers. I've been doing it for many, many years and I have no degree or any kind of like expertise in uh, any kind of therapy or any kind of license. But you know, neither did Dear Abby, right? So I'm, I'm simply answering their questions. So am I close with this? Because when kids ask me, you know, when kids have eating disorders, as as you know, many do, and yes. I, I say, picture that you're holding a baby in your arms and you're deciding, eh, I'm not going to feed this baby. It, you, you don't get to not feed yourself. That you are God's creature, just like that baby in your arms is God's creature, and you have to nourish her. That's just, sorry. You can you can be obsessed about something else, but you have to nourish this child of the universe. You just have to. And because right. sometimes with my OCD, I like being told you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm I've got that. That's not your concern. Stop checking. Right. You know, it. everything's fine. I'll check. And I don't know th that works for me, but I don't know if it's if it's the same. If you're just told you have to eat <laughs> and we're not going to discuss it. Well, I mean, one of the things that. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. One of the things that um, I've learned is, particularly in 12-step program, is that there are things that I, I can control and there are things that I can't control. Mm -hmm. And most of the things in the world I cannot control. Right. I am powerless over them. And, and one of the things that I've come to terms with is that I'm really powerless over the way I intrinsically look. I mean, we all can... Um, work at being in better shape. Yes. But you can't change your genes. Mm -hmm. And I spent most of my life trying to make myself look like what I didn't look like. Oh. And, you know, trying to force myself into this body, body type. Whereas I just was not that body type. Mm -hmm. So 
I didn't look good. I mean, I didn't look good as a thin. There are people who are naturally thin. I mean, I'm a thin person, but I was not I'm not a skinny person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to guess that most people are not skinny. I mean, when you look at the sizes, women's sizes, um, we never when I was growing up, we never had size zero. Right. Double zero. Right. I mean, it's a ridiculous it, it, standard. It, and I love seeing people of all sizes because mm -hmm. I'm seeing healthy people who are mm -hmm. just coming in different sizes and, and acknowledging we we come in different sizes. Right. Right. And and back to your the, what you were saying about your OCD, mm -hmm. it does in a way um, take the responsibility yes. off of me when I realize that I don't control this. Yes. Yes. How and I that can't do that. No matter how hard I try, I cannot achieve that. So it's really better to take care of myself and be healthy than try to make myself into something I can never be. Right. And, right. and when, to what end, anyway? Exactly. When you were on with us before, we had a, a very interesting conversation, and you admitted uh, that there was turmoil in your home growing up. Yes. And some darkness. And how much can outside forces and pressures play into your disease? Well, I, I would think that um, definitely my, my, my upbringing had a lot to do with it. Um, and also so the whole social construct of women need to be skinny mm -hmm. had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get down to it, really, it's about yourself and how you accept yourself. But the other outside forces, especially when you're in impressionable and form informative years mm -hmm. have a lot to do with how you treat yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the social pressures of, of being a certain way, looking a certain mm -hmm. way are. And it, was, and it was America when you were growing up, the fashions and the magazines, the advertising and the bombardment of uh, people that don't look like you, but you ought to look like them kind of a thing. What was I the mean, bottom? Was, Go ahead. Yeah. What was the I bottom for you? What, when, did sorry, you when, when did you realize that you needed to make a change? Was there a bottom as there is another addictive behavior where you said? Well, you know, I was being told that I had to or else I could die. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that certainly was a wake up call to some degree. You know, there, there were times when somebody said to me, you know, you could die from this. And I was like, OK, but really didn't fully mm -hmm. assimilate that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think. I think I realized I think I realized that I had to put on some weight to get out of the danger zone. But and that and that was probably in the early 80s um, when I weighed in the low 90s. Wow. But that wasn't my lowest for it. Do you still have to be conscious of your diet? Like every meal, think about I need to take on a certain number of calories. I have to have carbs. I have to have protein. Do you think about that now? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think about um, having a balanced diet. I, I consciously think about it because I, I want to make sure I get enough protein. I want to make sure I get enough good fats. I want to, and carbs are generally never a problem mm. with anybody because they're so delicious. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's just because I want to be healthy. But the, the, um, the titillation um, to restrict is still there for me. Mm. There's, you know, there's there's still that excitement that you know if I if I lose a pound, I still I still uh, get a rush from that. Wow, that's so oh, but interesting. I don't, but, the, but the key is I don't weigh myself anymore, except at the doctor's office when I have to. Yeah, I was going to ask you, that's like, so isn't that one of the things that you really shouldn't do is weigh yourself? Yeah, I stopped weighing myself um, a long time ago. And I only weigh myself if I absolutely have to at the doctor's office. Otherwise, I just say I weigh 120 pounds. Right. I'd rather not get on the scale. Yeah. But if I'm yeah. doing like something medical where they need to know, like, you know, if they need to know like a certain amount of anesthesia that, that they have mm -hmm. to give me, then they have to weigh me. Right. You know, I so know. I relent. Well, I'll tell you, I'm such a fan of your comedy. And you've, you've put some meaning in this block of time called... Does this Aww. show make me look fat? And I'm so excited for you. It's oh, June so 3rd, sweet. 4th, and 5th at the Pico Playhouse at 10508 West Pico Boulevard. Tickets at www. And this is all one word, Ticket Taylor, T-A-I-L-O-R.com. Or you can go to Kathy's website. 
Uh, now, will you? Are you going to bring backers to this? Are you looking to take it to another level, maybe off Broadway well, or something? I am looking to take it to another level. I'm not bringing backers to this that I certainly none that I know of because this is the first time this this version of the show is really out there. Mm -hmm. So we want to, That's why we're just doing it for three nights. And we want to see how it goes and. Then I want what I'm doing is I'm video I'm videotaping and I'm having a videographer come two nights mm -hmm. and then I can make a tape and contact some other um, certainly other theaters in other mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. But also I'd like to contact like the National Association of Eating Disorders. I was going to say, I, I mean, it's it, it's such a it's such a universal topic, maybe not yeah. anorexia, but bulimia, any of the other eating disorders, anything that requires a, tel a 12 step program for you to recover from. People can learn from it. So I, I just have a good feeling it's going to be successful for you. Oh, you're such a doll. Thank no, you no so No problem. Much. All right, my darling. We'll put the links in our show notes. And we Thank wish you. you. We know it's going to be wonderful. We can't wait to see it. Yeah. When you Thank go you off guys. Broadway, we'll come back and we'll do the whole hour about, you know, where are you going to live in New York and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Here come our closing credits. Thank we would you guys. Break sure. a leg. Of course. Break a leg, Donna. Take care. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guests, Jim Meskimen and Kathy Ladman. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman and Kathy Ladman, and we will see you along the media path.